May 10th, arrived and settled in at the Indian Queen Tavern on Chestnut Street. Met James Madison, who is also staying here. He and I paid a visit to Mr. Benjamin Franklin on Market Street. The old gentleman is 82, but he still exercises with a dumbbell. He reads while soaking in his copper tub shaped like a boot. May 11th. This is called the city of brotherly love, but there is nothing brotherly or sisterly about the way some women of the town regard your humble servant. I have never seen so many taverns and what the French call Maison de Passe. <laughs> That's a house that you only pass through. I love Philadelphia, but I wish more delegates would arrive. May 13th. Today, a great commotion outside my lodging. General Washington arrived. A crowd cheered him. Cannon saluted him. The landlady, Mrs. House, had prepared her best rooms here for him. But the financier, Robert Morris, came around and carried the general off to his fine brick mansion. There are lots of Baptists and abolitionists meeting in the city. She will have no trouble getting rumors. May 20th. Been here a week and still waiting. Will enough delegates ever arrive? I, I have not been idle in this greatest of American cities. I went with General Washington today to see Mr. Charles Wilson Peale's wonderful museum. It is the only one of its kind I have ever seen. We suddenly entered a room full of people. I nearly bowed to the women. Someone on the museum staff laughed. You know, those weren't people at all. They were made of wax. May 25th. Blessed be this day we have begun. Washington is here, an imposing and handsome man, over six feet. He gives the impression of confidence and power. James Madison, another Virginian, but Washington opposite. Thin, pale, small, no beauty. I am told he is a bookworm. I can believe it. He can quote European philosophers at just the right occasion. He complains of his health constantly. He took a seat up front and seemed to scribble down everything that was said. One of the delegates is Alexander Hamilton. He is good looking and extremely ambitious. Some call him effeminate, but I see no signs of it. A bit mysterious. He was born, they say, of unmarried parents in the West Indies, but went to school in New Jersey. He married well. He has no sympathy with our local loyalties, the states. He is a nationalist and wants a supreme central government. I confess he is persuasive, a real talker. Many impressive men have assembled here. For one, John Rutledge, governor of South Carolina, a lawyer with a fine reputation. He was one of the first to urge independence when we were colonies. Another, ex-governor Edmund Randolph, a southern aristocrat. He served as an aide to Washington along with Hamilton during the war. George Mason, another Virginian. I confess I liked him on sight. He dislikes politics. I understand he has refused many public offices, but he is a profound student of government. He wrote the Declaration of Rights as a member of the Virginia Convention back in 76. Thomas Jefferson drew on it when he wrote the Declaration of Independence. A man of a different type is Roger Sherman. He is the oddest man. He doesn't have much education, a wizened little man with an old-fashioned way of expressing himself, but he is shrewd. May 25th. General Washington said something that impressed us all. He said, there is no greater drama than the one we are playing out here. We examine.